Hello and welcome to Tonight at 8 from the RSGB. VDSL is the term used by most internet service providers to describe their faster fibre to the cabinet system, which is now quite commonplace with over 30 million installations in the UK alone. But although this much faster service is popular, it comes at a cost of much higher levels of radio frequency interference for most radio amateurs. Since 2014, the RSGB EMC committee has been investigating this and in the May 2020 issue of RADCOM described how to measure and report VDSL interference. Our presenter tonight is an RSGB board member and chair of the RSGB's EMC committee who will show you how to identify VDSL interference and record it. So a very warm welcome now to John Rogers, M0JAV. Good evening, John. Good evening, David. Thank you very much. And... Uh... I hope by the end of this, we'll have a few more people understanding uh, VDSL and a lot more people telling Ofcom if they have problems. Yep, well, that's what we're, we're here for tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing your talk and also a demonstration, I think, as well. So while John gets his slides ready, can I just remind you that if you're watching this on Monday the 13th of July, this is live. So you can interact with John both during and straight after the talk with questions and comments on both YouTube and the BATC web streamer. Details on how to sign in and comment on BATC are shown on that page. And please include your first name as well as your call sign if you're licensed. Also, please note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or clicking on the full screen button. I'll leave reading out most of your questions and comments until the end, although if there are any that we feel are best read to John during the presentation, I'll do so. But now back to John M0JAV with how to check for VDSL RFI. Thank you, David. Um... What I'm going to do is to explain, first of all, what VDSL is and uh, get you to try and find out whether it's causing you any radio frequency interference problems. Then tell you a little bit about some of the historical work. And the real purpose of this is to urge you that if you have a problem, to complain to RADCON. Full details how to do that are on page 18 of the May 2020 RADCON. So what is VDSL? It's fibre to the cabinet or super fast broadband. And what does that mean? That means that your internet is provided from the exchange through a fibre to a local cabinet where it's converted to copper wire and delivered to your home or business. The fibre optic cabinet is usually less than one and a half K from your house. One of the complications is it adds in the old telephone system and uses the existing wiring. And that means that as an engineering problem, you have to hope that crosstalk and radiation don't cause problems. The real problem for an amateur trying to identify it is that data is encoded or put onto the uh, wire in a pseudo random way onto 4,096 carriers, each 4.3K apart. So that means that VDSL looks on a spectrum and sounds on your speaker like wideband noise. The main reason you know it's there is it's blocking other signals. VDSL2 uses alternating upstream in red and downstream in green bands to send the information between your service provider and your home. There are three up and three down, and that gives a bandwidth downstream of just over 12 megs and upstream of just over five. But the important point to us is that there's a 50 kilohertz gap left between adjacent up and downstream bands. And that gives us the signature that we can look for to see if the problem is VDSL. This is a spectrum at the top and a waterfall at the bottom. It's actually covering the top end of downstream two band, the bottom end of downstream three band and all of upstream two. Now what we need to look for are these dips. And the important level is the bottom of those dips. 
because that in the transition or guard bands, there is no VDSL transmission. So if VDSL was not there, your noise floor would be down here and not 30 to 40 degrees higher up here. You can also see sometimes big level changes between the down and upstream bands. And this shows you where they all are. And you can see here the dip again. Now, this is a different type of device. This is actually a calibrated field strength logger. So it's measuring the field strength at nearly 50 dB microvolts per meter, which is way above where it should be. So it, it, what, the, what we need to do now is to answer the question, why does the level of the RFI vary so dramatically between installations and between bands? To understand that, we have to realize that in order for RFI to happen, it has to have a way of coupling from the source to the victim. In this case, the source is a telephone wire and the victim is your radio receiver. You can do it two ways. It can either be radiated to the victim or it can be conducted to the victim. And in conduction, it's not only a DC short circuit that will carry it through, but you can have reactive coupling as well. So you can have inductive or capacitive coupling to a conductor that goes close to the victim and the source. So where does it actually come from? Well, in the VDSL2 cabinet that sits in the street outside, you have fiber going in and copper coming out. The copper goes to another local cabinet down the road a bit where it adds your ordinary telephone wire. And all of that copper is often badly balanced. As soon as you get a resistive or reactive imbalance, you will get some common mode generated. And that common mode will couple in to the copper wire and come through. So you can see here on this cabinet, uh, how the fiber and all of the copper for many, many wires are all shared together inside a box. They then go via normally underground cables to telephone poles and then overhead wires to the master socket in your house and extension wiring in your house, all of which is tens of meters long normally will be very efficient aerials and they will radiate the signal. The other thing that impacts how strong the RFI is that you receive is how far you are from that fiber cabinet. Now here on the left, the graph shows how the bit rate, the vertical axis, and the distance from the cabinet changes. So close to the cabinet, you can easily get 80 megabits per second. But once you get one and a half Ks away, you're probably down to 20 megabits per second. Not only that, but also the system is having to try much harder and probably using more power on the upstream bands to get the signal through. So what this amounts to is that you get downstream interference near to cabinets, because there you've got many, many different telephone lines with effectively white noise on them, all adding up to give you an increased noise background. Whereas further from the cabinet, the only lines you're likely to see are your nearest neighbors. So you're likely to go down from less than 10 near to you for the upstream to potentially hundreds if you happen to be near to the cabinet. So in summary, the upstream interference is stronger if you're further from the cabinet. And that's because the modems in your house use high, or your neighbor's house as well, use higher signal strengths to overcome the line losses in the longer lines. 
Now, we have actually um, used this to our advantage in trying to detect where the RFI is most likely to happen. And the other thing that's important to realize is that of the 30 million installations that there are of this approximately, a lot of them are throttled back to 20 megs. So they've got spare capacity, but they're not using it because the user's not paying for it. So what I'm going to do now is to be very brave and run live for a while. And I'm showing you here what I'm actually using. So outside, I have a Wellbrook loop, active loop, and an active dipole. They're feeding into an SDR play or a pair of SDR plays. And on the end of that, I either have the SDR UNO software or I have a spectrum analyzer. So if I come out of that, on the top of the screen now, you can see a spectrum analyzer. If I start it running, that is looking at the E field from a telephone wire that runs across my property. And at first, it doesn't look like it's telling you very much. That's because all of the VDSL is pseudo random noise. If I put some averaging onto that, you will begin to see some patterns appear. And in fact, to save time, I did this just beforehand. So this is the sort of pattern you get after you've averaged to get rid of the pseudo random noise. So there's a strange sort of step up here at eight and a half megahertz. And there's a fairly big step down here at 12 megahertz. There's also a step up here at 3.8 megahertz and one down here at 5.2 megahertz. Now, isn't that strange? That just happens to be the transition frequencies for VDSL. So all of the signals in this sort of region here and this region here are being completely obscured if they are of lower level than the VDSL RFI. And I would expect the noise floor here to be somewhere around minus 115 normally. So it's actually knocking me out everywhere. At the bottom of the screen, if you were to look at the same thing running live on your SDR UNO software, then what you see is a sort of a characteristic pattern in the waterfall. But what you find is it's a bit more difficult to find the transitions because the averaging isn't being done. You can see one there going up a bit, but it's nowhere near as clear if I just line the two up on the x-axis you can see how the transitions are much clearer on the spectrum analyzer than they are looking at the waterfall of the STR. So hopefully that's giving you some idea of how simple it is to look to see if you have it. Now, if you do have the interference, <laughs> then what I've tried to show you is that you can see it much better if you use averaging. In fact, this is the location which is a bit closer to another line that runs across my property. And here you can see very clearly on the average display the big hump that represents upstream one band. So it's important to use the averaging to give a clearer picture. And you should expect, depending on whether you're using a loop H-field antenna or a dipole or monopole E-field antenna, to get somewhat different pictures. 
Now, you might ask, what would I expect the background to be if VDSL wasn't there? Well, helpfully, an organization called the ITU published some expected graphs in a standard called 372. And what they do is they show you three dotted sloping lines for expected levels of background noise in the presence of normal environments. So the bottom one is quite rural. The mi middle one is rural and the top one is residential. And to give you a feeling, um, 30 megahertz, you should be expecting an E-field of about zero dB microvolts per meter. And at one megahertz, you should be expecting about plus 10 dB microvolts per meter. Now, if you remember, all of the graphs I've shown you so far have had numbers with fours and fives on the beginning. So there have been 45 or 55 dB microvolts per meter. That shows you that the VDSL level in some of the worst locations can be up to 40 dB above the background level. The other funny lines on here are what happens with atmospheric noise at night and during the, the day and also the galactic noise level. So that's the sort of levels that one would expect to find without the presence of big interferers. So how can we tell whether we've got it and what can we measure? This is <coughs> um, SDR UNO running at a different location to mine. And here you can see it is at 12 megahertz, which is the transition between upstream two and downstream three. And you can quite clearly see that if this is where the background noise should be, that we're getting 20 dBs up on upstream two and 10 dBs up on downstream three. Now we exploited this and we did a survey uh, back in December 27. It was in RADCOM, the results of it. And many of you helped with that. Thank you very much. And what we did was we used just the change in level between the VDSL bands, asked people to take a meeting on a reading on their S meters, and then to report the steps, report the level to us. We calculated the step sizes and provide, we did ask them to try and avoid real signals in the area, but it gave us a good idea of the distribution of the levels of interference. Because we were only using the difference in levels at frequencies 50 kilohertz apart, any variations between receivers, antennas, and S meters with frequency were not important because we were only looking at the step size. What we found from this work was that here we've got the number of people, 1,200 people responded. Here we've got the step sizes in dB, up to 40 dB and more. And we plotted separately for overhead feed and underground feed. And we said if the level was 3 dB or less, then we would say it wasn't really causing a problem. So if 47% of respondees didn't have a problem, that means 53% did have a problem. And because we did this for each of the band transitions, of the 1,200 people who replied, 55% of them had step sizes, which probably would have caused a problem. And 25%, a quarter of the total, had uh, seriously degraded reception. The actual results here show how the upstream bands were worse, two worse than upstream one, and then the downstream bands in terms of the level of interference they gave. The results for underground were a bit different as one might expect, but there was a lot more underground interference than we expected. And we're pretty certain that that came about because the internal house wiring 
was radiating the signal. So even though it went all the way underground to the master socket, the actual internal house wiring was then acting as a brilliant antenna and radiating it back out to interfere with our radios. So we did some comparisons and some checks. We did over a year's worth of work with Ofcom. Um, and that was at six members QTHs and Ofcom produced their results and we produced our results of that work. And the conclusions we came to, unsurprisingly, were not the same. So what we needed was some way of finding out how bad the situation is was without doing individual readings. And also we wanted some software that would actually allow us to confirm that VDSL was present. So we first of all, we used a field strength logger, which measured the uh, field strength at a given point. What it actually did, it's a wind radio Excalibur, was it recorded the field strength and the position <coughs> to a file on the computer. And the readings it took were frequencies which were stored in a table which was driving the SDR, and it stepped through the frequencies, recorded all the data along with the GPS. And that then allowed us to come up with an idea of the level. And you can see up the top right there that in this particular reading, which was taken at this frequency, the level was 57.4 dB microvolts per meter, and the background without VDSL would have been 11. So that one is 46 dB up. So we fitted this whole system into a car and drove around, and we reported this in the January 2018 Radcom. And here you can see the loop on the top of a car. Everything else is running on batteries inside the car. And we basically drove around, recorded all the readings at each frequency. This one's at 3.85 megs. And then imported it into Excel and produced a heat map against the positions. So here, for example, we're getting more than 40 dB microvolts in the road. And that happens to be just down the road from where I live. And as I drove around, up and down various streets, you can see how here, where we were in a country park, the level was very low, way below the rural and getting close to the quiet rural, which is what you'd expect. But when you came around town, you got yellows and oranges, which showed there were high levels. So we could now prove that there were levels at the VDSL frequencies. What we couldn't do was categorically prove it was VDSL. So what we needed was the ability to detect VDSL messages. And Martin Sack, G8KDF, who was involved in writing some of the original software for VDSL, came to the rescue with his knowledge of the actual message structure used by VDSL. So it encodes the signals using some complicated modulation called quadrature amplitude modulation. And that allowed it to use eight amplitudes and eight phases to encode 64 bits of information onto a symbol. But for, to us poor amateurs sitting and listening on our radios, all we heard was white noise. But with knowledge of how VDSL is encoded, there are two features, although they're pseudo-random, that repeat across the message. The first is the sync symbol, which keeps the clocks in sync. And the second one is something that is added to minimize cross-channel interference. That's called cyclic extension. This bit gets a bit techy, so, uh, but it doesn't go on for long. So basically what you need to do is this is your message in this part here, two end samples of it. 
and you want to put that symbol next to another one in time. Now, if you just bolt them together, you'll get big discontinuities, you'll get spectral spreading, and it won't work. So what VDSL does is it takes a bit of the real signal from the, the beginning of the message packet, puts it on the end, vice versa with the bit at the end, and puts it on the beginning. And then it can window in the traditional way to stop spectral spreading, but it's windowing something which although it has exactly the same characteristics as a message, is not the actual message. So if we get some corruption in this part of the message, or this part of the message from the windowing, it doesn't matter. And you can actually look for that um, by correlating the signal with itself, providing your clocks are in sync. So there's some more clever software that actually lines up the SDR clock with the clock used in the VDSL message and does all this clever work for us. Now we go back to not being quite so techy. So this is the actual software running. You can download it off the RSGB website. What I want to do is just describe to you what the four graphs are. So the first one is just the windowed spectrum. So you can see the background level. Oh, you can already see a bit of a characteristic dip at 3.8 megs. And you can see the real signals. And what the software has done here is to plot a line, which is going to say anything above that line is not VDSL, it's a real signal. So in digital processing, it extracts all of the signals above the line. And then you end up with the graph top right. And on that graph over here, you can see a bit more clearly the step. But what it's done is it's taken away all the real signals to prevent them from corrupting the next processing that you do. It then looks at that and uses the order correlation to look for peaks. And the peak at 0 and 360 degrees is one VDSL signal. And surprisingly enough, that's another one, and that's another one. So it means that this particular person is suffering interference from three different telephone lines. The final graph here is a check on how accurately the clocks have been aligned. If those two lines look reasonably like a sine wave and they line up with each other, then the clocks have been pretty well aligned. So that's a bit of software called Leilantos, developed by Martin, which then allows us to categorically say the main interference at this particular property is VDSL. If you happen to be very unlucky, you might end up with something like this, whereby the zero degree here and the 360, that's one, that's two, this little kink here, and that one there is three. And in total, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different VDSL lines, all adding up to the interference at this particular property. So what does this all do to us? It gives us good broadband and good internet signals, but it also creates a lot of interference. And we in the EMC committee are not only worried about the interference this causes, but we're far more worried about the fact that Ofcom will do nothing about it. Because this is, if you like, is a bellwether of what's going to happen as more and more digital signals come in. And if the makers of those digital systems are not forced to meet the EMC directive, then eventually the bands will all be wiped out. And of course, it's there all the time. And it's pink noise all the way from close to zero megahertz up to 17.7 megs. 
And a lot of people lose 80% of their signals because of it. At some locations, only a few percent of the signals can actually be picked up. The message we have to Ofcom is how can that be anything but harmful? Particularly when you consider that the upstream bands, which are the worst, contain the international emergency band and the low power digital propagation bands. Other countries aren't seeing the problem. I wonder why that is. It's because when the system was designed, it was designed with a technology called notching. And that notching was to be applied to block out bands that might be sensitive to interference. And in fact, in the standard, the bands that are used as an example are the amateur bands, the international amateur bands. So if BT, in their wisdom, had implemented notching, um, or, and or, given as better match telephone lines, then it wouldn't be a problem. And that's why it's not so much of a problem in many other countries. So having done all that work, we then went along to Ofcom. We had a series of meetings with them and some with um, OpenReach as well. And we persuaded them to do some testing with us. They did that testing, which was finished last year. And in fact, you know, they found exactly the same as us. This is one of their measurements, which is in their report, which you can find on their website. And, you know, we can see quite clearly there's 25 dB of interference there. But in their wisdom, they concluded that that wasn't a problem. They said that, Yep, there was an electromagnetic disturbance, definitely. They'd measured it, they'd seen it, we were right all along. But, you know, other things affect reception, like atmospherics, how strong the signal is, and therefore the fact that VDSL caused a bit more of a problem wasn't a real worry. And anyway, you had to remember that there were 25 million people using VDSL for data, so the fact that um, we had only seen complaints from 30 amateurs over a five-year period meant they didn't need to do anything about it. So in short, after all this work, I agreed with us there was an electromagnetic disturbance, but so few people complained that they weren't going to do anything about it. So we thought, what do we do next? And as you've probably seen recently, we put an appeal from the president into RADCOM. Um, the link up there, VDSL reporting on the website, tells you everything I've told you about how to do it. It also contains information about um, the sort of things you need to report. It gives you links to the software, allows you to run it yourself. So all you need to do to run that software is to make a simple recording on an SDR, either your own or somebody at your club or a friend who's got one, and come along, take half a second of recording, and then you can analyze it on your computer. So we show the example here for SDR you know, um, and what we want you to do is to set it up as shown. I'll do this in a moment, but the important thing is to have zero IF, selected to use about a two megahertz bandwidth and then to start the recorder. Having started it, you then need to go to the recording panel, press start recording, wait for about half a second, press stop recording, and you're done. Shouldn't be too difficult. So let's see if I can do it. So down the bottom here, what I'll do is I'll make that fill the screen. We have the Uno. Um, it is running. I have set to zero IF, but I haven't set the bandwidth to two megahertz. So if I stop it and 
quickly uh, change it and don't you know it's crashed <laughs> um, <laughs> it's because I left it running I guess always the best way yeah that sort of thing happens um, we'll let you restart then yeah um, it's coming up so okay so what I need to do is on this window here, assuming it will move screens, I need to set 0IF on that part there. I know you can't read this. I need to set the sample rate to 2, and then I need to press play. So if I press play... Uh, I, I'm going to give up and just admit that it didn't work this time. I did it three times just before we came on the air, and it worked fine. Um, but no, it didn't. So, but can you but tell us is, what we what we would expect to see if you if that had worked, John? Um, you would you would have just seen the waterfall run. You would, could have gone to the um, button on the record panel, pressed record waited half a second and pressed stop. And you would then have ended up with um, your recording and the bits that you had to set were 0 IF in this window, 2 megahertz, and you hit the button to start or stop it. You also have to set up the center frequency that you wanted, in this case, 7 megahertz. That would have written a short f file to your computer disk, which you can then pick up and read back in to Leilantos. And okay. when I did this last week and played it back into Leilantos, this was the results I got of the recording. So you can see the 3.8 and the 5.2 steps. There weren't many real signals because most of them were obscured by VDSL. Um, but having filtered them out, we had an absolutely perfect alignment on the two clocks after lots of processing. And there you can quite clearly see I have a very strong BDSL signal and possibly a second much weaker one. So fortunately, a lot of you have done this and we already have around about 70 results that we've analyzed. The graph on the right here shows you the confirmed bands in which we've seen problems. And these have been reported to Ofcom and they've been very good at responding. They usually respond within 24 hours and they ask you to do things like turning your mains off, fitting a better faceplate to your um, VDSL lines, and they're very sensible things to do, but they don't fix it. They also want you to keep, this is a good one. Could you please keep a log of the stations you can't hear, as well as the ones you can hear? All right? So keeping a log of the stations you can hear is sensible. Keeping a log of the stations you can't hear is a bit more taxing. But in fact, there are ways you can do that. Um, you can prearrange skeds with people and you can record them when they can hear you. You can't hear their reply, but you can use somebody near you to confirm that their reply was heard without VDSL present. Or you can use one of the online SDRs like Hack Green. The other evidence that you really need to collect is or other ways of collecting it, is to do a here and there test, whereby you can set up two SDRs at close locations, one where you've found the interference and one where you haven't, and just write down how many more signals you can hear at one and the other. You can also keep logs of scheduled contacts, which you couldn't make because of the VDSL, and you can use one-way paths like Whisper to identify places where your signal was picked up, but you couldn't hear any stations coming back. And, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of Whisper 
in most locations. So, how can open reach reduce it? Well, they all, they will come out and improve the line balance. You can clean up self installs, but the really important thing that they need to do is notch the bands. And what we're trying to do with all this work is to persuade them that there is enough problem out there to make it worthwhile notching the bands. What can you do? You can try the NTE 5C faceplate, and if you look on page 56 of this year's RADCOM, David Lauder gives a good explanation of how to do that. You can disconnect unused extensions. You can put in common node filters, and we can request a line balance. But none of those things, and we've tried hundreds of them, fix the problem. So you can move your antennas around. You can try current transformers and phase match and knock it out that way. You can actually knock out some of the frequencies that VDSL uses by putting an open circuit stub on to force a short circuit, which stops it using that. But you still don't get rid of enough signals to get all those weak DX in. So one thing we'd always thought was roll on FTTP. Now, last week, um, FTTP became available at my address. So I thought, before I um, go on it, I'll take a measurement of fibre to the cabinet. And this particular reading is round about 45 dB on the field strength logger, 43.6. Um, and that, there's a recommendation for measurement. Don't worry about it. It's called RECO 902. That is the recommended maximum emission from a telephone line according to the standards. And that FTTC level was 15 dB above it. So then when I got my FTTP, I couldn't wait to run outside and test it, could I? So I did that. And believe it or not, the level went up with FTTP to be 5 dB higher than it was with FTTC. Now, how on earth could this happen? That's a little bit of blurb about the method we used and how we compared it with various things. But the way it happened was the fiber drop wire contains one twisted pair for the plain old telephone system. And that twisted pair is connected up to the FTTC cabinet and the cabinet down the road in exactly the same way as the old one was. And perhaps the most interesting thing was that I quickly did some speed tests before they disconnected my FTTC down the new copper wire. And whereas with the old drop wire, I got 20 megabits per second. With the new one, I got 72 megabits per second. I'm pleased to say that I do get one gigabit per second on the fiber. So that's showing you there the twisted pair, the fiber and all the packing around the fiber, and they're connected together to give the drop cable. So that gives you, I hope, a bit of an introduction and uh, I would like to acknowledge the help I had from various members of the EMC committee, um, Steve Carter, Dave Lauder and Martin Sack. And if you want to find out more details about what I've said, there's a web address. So thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, John. It's a complex subject, and um, Johnny won't be surprised to know that there's quite a few people who've uh, been asking some questions, and maybe it's gone a bit above them uh, as well which is understandable there's quite a lot of technical terms that we've had to use in tonight's program but what we'll try and do is, is ask, answer some of them at least um, and uh, meantime you're gonna I believe change from your slide to back to seeing a picture of you 
and then we'll be able to see what you look like and uh, people will be able to answer the questions. So if you haven't already done so, you're very welcome to ask questions or make comments on either BATC or on the YouTube channel. I know we already have some questions there and I'll be reading them to John uh, now, but uh, this is the time to ask those questions. The point of this being live is that you can do that. Um, I'm going to start with a question on YouTube, which was from, I don't know your name, I'm afraid. It was from Saltire. Saltire546 is your sort of name on YouTube. And um, you said to start with, OK, this is what they must be doing here as my next door has a big telephone pole which distributes lots of telephone lines to various houses. I don't know if having full fibre will cure it. Well, quite a few other little discussions on there, John. And I think probably, in fact, you've answered some of that now because you've just gone over to fibre. Um, I think your friend as well, your colleague Steve C, um, has uh, suggested that it's not necessarily going to solve it. But let, let me ask that question to you anyway. Is for, you, for someone who's just done it, full fibre, how successful has it been for you? Well, I've, I've shown the example of uh, my particular phone line um, quite close to it. And what it has done, I'm pleased to say, is it's actually reduced most of the other bands, the noise from most of the other bands. But what will be required for it to be completely fixed is for all of your neighbours to go to full fibre as well because the crosstalk won't come in from your neighbours' lines if they're all on fibre. At least that's my hope. Okay. Um, just on that piece of cable, which I don't know, I must have, I've never seen anything quite like that before. So you had a twisted pair next to the fibre. That twisted pair, if it's not terminated, is that causing some of the problem? And is there a way that you can officially or unofficially terminate it without causing any damage obviously to anything from BT just to sort of suppress the noise that's coming up that twisted pair well the twisted pair but when they come to install it what they do is they go up the pole outside they cut down the old telephone wire come to your house disconnect the telephone wire where it joins up to the master socket and then they put up the fiber and they connect the copper pair to give you back your telephone line um, you, if you go to digital, they will still provide that because there is potential for an emergency requirement. There is a potential necessity to actually give you a copper pair. So it is properly terminated in the master socket. Okay. So, all right. The so problem that's... is it's picking up noise from inside the cabinet or from crosstalk between the cables between the cabinet and the property. And that is still there. In fact, because it's now a much better line, um, it's actually getting there at a stronger level than it was before. There's only one pair instead of three, which there is in a normal line. Okay. Thank you. Got a question now from uh, on the BATC website. Um, we've got uh, Greg, M0ODZ, uh, of the RSGB ESRG, is asking roughly how many people have responded to the article so far? Um, as far as I know... Um, it's getting on, it's somewhere between 70 and 100. I haven't counted it recently. I know Steve uh, Carter did the last analysis, so he may be able to answer that one uh, via the text. So shall we go on to the next one and hope he answers it for me? Yes, OK, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, we've got several other comments as well. Several people just saying that the whether the fibre should go overground or underground, and um, I gather from the answers from Steve on there that, that it goes on either um, before it gets to your premises. We've got uh, DX Commander has come on and said he's read your report and it was excellent work. Thank you, Callum. Nice to see you again. Pity you haven't still got your narrowboat. <laughs> All right. Um, is there any correlation, or sorry, he's, he actually changed it after that. Is there any variation between the DSLAM vendors? But before I let you answer that, could you just explain for everybody at home what a DSLAM is? But if you remember, I show you a picture of an FTGC cabinet with the door open and all of the electronics in there is the DSLAM. It's the bit that actually converts the fiber data into copper data and then sends it down the copper wire for the FTGC signal. There are two manufacturers used um, that wonderful company we hear so much about that I can't pronounce, Huawei, and another one, I think it's ESG or ECG. Um, they both meet the same standards, but yes, there is a difference in that the transition, the guard bands, 
there's an option to move them by a few kilohertz. And the guard band for the two manufacturers are slightly different. So you can tell which manufacturer of D-SLAM you've got. Afraid I can't remember which is which, but I think they're about 25 kilohertz apart. Um, if you want to know, uh, Callum, I'll make a note of that and, and um, send you an answer as to which is which. Okay, yeah, there'll be an opportunity to uh, do that as well afterwards if you've got any queries. I think you can uh, leave a message via the RSGB webpage that we've put up. And we'll put that link up for you again in a moment so that if you don't have the RADCOM from May 2020, or indeed you're not a member of the RSGB, this is not about the RSGB doing this, this is the RSGB doing it on behalf of all radio amateurs. So whether you're an RSGB member or not, they want you to they've made a call for action really for everybody to report it if you have these sort of problems. Uh, we've got Peter Hubbersty and he has asked, I was under the impression that D-SLAMS and CPE was capable of backing off depending on line reflection, power characteristics of each line. Is that not being used? The, um, there are two ways. Uh, you, you either have the signals being originating in the D-SLAM and going to the modem in your house, or they originate in the modem in your house and go back to the D-SLAM. Now, the latter is called upstream, and each of the modems have something called upstream power back off. And what they do is they back off the power um, that's used to transmit signals back to the cabinet to a level that gets through without too much loss. That is used, and that's why people who are further from the cabinet have much stronger interference on the upstream bands because they're running flat chat to get the signals back. There is some negotiation that goes on between the D-SLAM and the modem at startup, which sets power levels, but it's not clear to me whether that's done on an individual basis or whether it's an engineering mode. We don't see any consistent changes. It, it, it's roughly the same everywhere for the downstream side. Okay, John, thank you. Um, Steve Carter has replied and said that we're aware of just over 70 formal complaints that have been made to Ofcom to date. And that allows me to say, if you have replied to Ofcom and not sent us the email, please do so, because otherwise we won't know that you've responded. There was an email address in the May Radcom and on the website telling you how to do it. Yes, and in fact, we've just put up the link again for anybody who's uh, not sure or if they haven't maybe got their uh, May 2020 Ofcom, uh, Radcom sorry, available. Being frank with you now, John, and I'm asking on behalf of lots of people watching now, 70 doesn't sound really that many. Is that the sort of numbers that we need to get Ofcom to take action? Or can you give us an idea of how many you feel they'll need to have as hard complaints before they take some strong action to BT OpenReach? We were targeting 100 um, as a minimum. We had 1,200 before, remember. So I know it's a bit more difficult to do all of the work, but there's no reason why you shouldn't send in an individual complaint based on the original mechanism of just looking at the edges. You don't have to use Leilantos. So we would like to get a few hundred. Then we can scotch the rumour that five a year is not enough to worry about. When we've done that, we then need to get into discussions with both Ofcom and OpenReach to see what we can get them to do about this nuisance. So I guess I'm pleased we had 70 and I'm disappointed we didn't have 500. OK, that's honest. Thank you for that. So if you are watching this and you suffer from VDSL interference or you're not sure where your interference is coming from, uh, this program tonight, which has been quite deep, uh, you'll be able to watch it back, by the way, as well. Um, we had a few questions of that on the YouTube channel. That'll be up very, very shortly again, so you can watch back some of it. And, of course, refer to that article in Radcom and uh, from May 2020 and that link as well, which uh, we gave a moment ago. That will help you do that. Um, we've got another question here um, from Dr. HWO. How big a task is the notching process for BT? That's uh, from Howard. Um, all of the equipment has the notching built in. So BT need to turn it on. Um, 
it's a case of having um, if they took we've we've actually offered them two options in the past. One of them is certain bands like ten point one to ten point one five, they could notch out universally without impacting their um, broadband bandwidth at all. Fifty kcs, hundred kcs isn't going to make any difference. For some of the bigger downstream bands, they would probably want to notch only where the problems were reported. Um, and that would be much more labor intensive, hence costly uh, for them to do. So the, the problem is we actually use the proportionality argument back on them here because we say we're only asking you to notch out a very small percentage of the bands. The standard requires you to be able to do this. The equipment has the ability to do it. Please do it. Hmm. Um, one question I think that I'm asking on behalf of others, in case people are not quite so sure how this all works, we've mentioned BT a lot tonight, but of course specifically we're talking about OpenReach, aren't we, which is the division that delivers the internet to the home, and although you may have other providers like Sky and Plusnet and people like that, uh, is, is, are there any other providers, Virgin comes to mind, as I know they take internet straight to premises, are there any other providers that um, need to be lobbied to reduce this noise on VDSL? As far as I'm aware, the only people that use FTTC are BT OpenReach. Um, I'm sorry, I have a habit because they were BT when I started working with them. I have a habit of keep calling them BT. They are a separate organization to the BT who actually provide the service or Virgin, Sky, um, Talk, Talk, all the other service providers. Uh, sorry, Virgin, some of cable suppliers um, will do not need to use FTTC, but the only supplier of FTTC in England and I think in the UK is BT OpenReach. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, got a, Peter Hubstey's come back and said, I've got no antennas at the moment, it's QRT, just a few rigs, but what is the easiest, quickest way I can participate? Um, he says that my 80 meter and 40 meter are unusable. Is there a way that he can, or and others can participate? Um, you can you, you don't have to have the best antenna in the world because the signal level is so strong. You can get away with a long wire or a, a wire dipole, just connect it to a receiver and make the measurements. You don't need to be able to transmit, so it doesn't have to be perfectly matched. You just need to be able to measure the S level on your S meter or connect it to an SDR and take a note of the spectrum and the level changes. Okay. Um, on YouTube, one thing we, I'm sorry, John. One thing we would like to encourage our clubs to do, and members, is if they have an SDR um, and they know that, you know, a friend or colleague down the road doesn't have one, then once lockdown is, is out and it's safe to do so, to go around and help them by making a recording, either take one of your own portable antennas or use their antenna, make a recording, and then they'll be able to do the analysis and send in the response. Thanks, David. Okay, yeah, the um, SDR play that you've referred to a lot in that, it's one of the lowest cost SDR receivers, I think about £100 or so like that. But if you have got another SDR, is it possible to get data in the right format for, for Lelantos software to actually interpret and do that report? Yes, you can do it for any. Um, it, it helps if it's got a 2 megahertz bandwidth, which means some of the things like the, uh, the dongles um, don't have. You can still use it. It just isn't as accurate if it has, um, say, 192 kilohertz bandwidth. Okay. Um, but if you choose a, an area, and you, you may have to make more recordings to get one that's definitive. Okay, yes, yeah, so we've got actually Graham Cowan asked a very similar sort of question on that, G7LMF. He said, uh, John used a couple of antennas and SDR Uno. Can I get a result with just a simple RTL SDR dongle? So that one specifically, yes. because that's quite low cost and a lot of people have them. Yes, you can. As I said, you know, to cover the bandwidth, you need to make more recordings, but that doesn't take long. And you'll find that perhaps some of the recordings you make in a 200 kilohertz bandwidth will give you a stronger indication of um, 
a VDS on interference and others will. But if you're willing to take a few, works fine. We did all our initial tests using those because uh, the plays weren't around at the time. No, okay. Well, we're coming to the end of the program now. If you've got a question for John, you need to answer it in the next 30 seconds or so, I think, because we're just coming up to the last couple of questions, either on BATC, and the instructions how to do that are at the bottom of the page, or on uh, YouTube in the usual way. Got uh, John Dooley says, I live near three antenna masts, 220 plus metres uh, above sea level. So delta loops is what I use to null and magnetic loops. Any thoughts on that, John? Um, we, we've done work with the, um, it's, I don't call it a magnetic loop, an H-field antenna with the uh, um, Wellbrook loop that I've got out the back. It's quite close to my neighbour's telephone line. And um, Ofcom have actually been round here and done some measurements. And they said, um, you've put that antenna too close to the telephone line what a stupid thing to do so i turned it through 90 degrees and pointed out that it completely nulled that telephone line when it was in the null of the loop so yes it does work yes you can do it with a loop um but you can only null one line at a time and the best place to null it is directly underneath it okay I've got a question now from John Harrison. He says, sorry, I missed the start. How do I know if this is a problem to me? And how do the RSGB expect radio hams to set up to do these tests, etc., when some of us have no interest in SDR or computers? Well, I'm going to hand over, obviously, to John to answer that. But one of the things, John, and for everybody now watching this, if you did miss part of the start uh, as well, you will be able to watch this whole program on the YouTube channel of the RSGB in its entirety to watch it back carefully and some of the tests and how to do it. But to, to answer John Harrison specifically, John, any other suggestions or comments? It, lo it looks quite onerous, maybe, to some people. Well, it, yeah, perhaps I should have, have just done the two minutes of how to do it, <laughs> which didn't work. Um, it is very easy, and there are people around in your club or, or close to you who can help you to do this. And, um, you know, if you're, you're really stuck... Uh, if you come into VDSL help, um, the email address, then we will try and get somebody to talk you through how to do it. Well, you can't say fairer than that. John, thank you ever so much for tonight's webinar. It's been, as I said, quite a deep, difficult subject, but EMC is like that, isn't it? That's the point of it. But we really like to thank you very much for tonight and also the reporting. And, and really, you're looking, you're trying to look after the hobby as a whole here, not just, this isn't just for the RSGB, as I said earlier. It's up to all of us, if we suffer from VDSL interference, to do something. But once more, thanks very much to uh, John uh, for tonight's talk and that ends tonight's tonight at eight and on your behalf i'd like to thank john as i said and also don't forget that you can read the radcom article in this subject by visiting www.rsgb.org forward slash vdsl dash reporting we hope you've enjoyed tonight's webinar and if you'd like to see details of future webinars or send us any comments or feedback please visit www.rsgb.org forward slash webinars so until next time this is david g7rp signing off and clear good night